Hello and welcome to another episode of the Pew Football Podcast with me, Guillem Balaguer. In times of confusion, I'll tell you what to do. You put together a bunch of privileged brains and you ask them questions. The kind of people I mean are those that said, see the path and the way forward before most of us. So I kind of wondered what uh, football, the industry, the game as well, will look like in the near future and in some years ahead as well. And I decided to ask some of my friends who have good, a good understanding of what's going on and will try to help us decipher what, where, what is it that we are going. So we've got with us Avram Grant, league and cup winner with different teams, manager of Israel, Chelsea, of course, West Ham, Ghana, and with a fascinating 360 degrees view on football and life. And he has the ear of some of the most powerful people in world football. Charlie Stilitano, where to start? Uh, sports executive, radio star in Sirius XM, executive chairman of uh, Relevant Sports, which of course holds the famous International Champions Cup in the summer. And in fact, he's one of the most influential people in global football. And Gab Marcotti, now of ESPN, is a writer, broadcaster of the highest caliber. In fact, he's my favorite. And able to discuss with the same powerful arguments that the sky is red, that is blue, that is pink, and that it has no color. Uh, his books and his articles always leave you with food for thought and generally new ideas. So thank you all for um, coming on to the uh, uh, your football podcast. Uh, let's start with the most immediate. Football is coming back, and there is one temporary uh, rule that's going to change, which is unsurprising for physical reasons, but can have big implications in the game. The five substitutions. So, let me go first to the to the coach Avram. Five substitutions, and generally, what do you think football will look like in the next few weeks in this week? Uh, okay. uh, First, the football competitions. First, the football will look like with no supporters, but I think it will be many millions of millions of supporters, even more than ever, on the TV and they will watch. As a coach, and uh, if I'm a speaker in the name of the players, it will be very, very difficult to play without supporters. But uh, And we saw it in the German league last weekend. We watched it and it was not so nice without supporters. But life is choosing between alternatives. If you would ask me two months ago, I was, and people ask me from different associations around the world, I say, don't play without supporters. It's not, it's not uh, the nature of the game when you want it. But life is, as I said before, it's a, a choosing between alternative. Now, if the, if the choice is to stay home or to play without supporters on the pitch and people will watch on the TV and people will back to the business as players, as staff, coaches and others, I think it's a, it, this is the right solution. It's better. Of course, it will not be forever, but to start with, it's good. About the rules of uh, five substitutions. Look, everybody said that football is conservative. I think it's bullshit. I'm sorry, but uh, football changed a lot of rules. Red card when you are the last one, uh, technology of uh, AI, uh, many, many things. And I remember I was uh, in the last season when I was a coach of Chelsea that was allowed only five on the bench, 11 players, five on the bench. So we had a squad of 27 players, and in Chelsea, for example, 11 or 12 international players that played for the national team, like Sean Mark Phillips and Asik, was not even on the bench, Couldn't, uh, which is not good for football players. And uh, I remember even one time that Hank Tenkart, as you know, your friend, yes, uh, said to mm -hmm. me, when you are announced the team, I say, three o'clock, uh, four o'clock, he says, three, how can I leave? I say, why? Well, a few of the players will want to kill you because of this and then they change it to seven on the bench and now i heard that some uh, they want to change it that uh, maybe more players will be on the bench which is the nature of the game it's your players are working hard all the game all the week and at least you can uh, given the opportunity to stay, the, uh, stay on the page so many rules change so to change substitute to five i think it's too much but we are doing it they are doing it now because a very short preparation not a good preparation a fixture that you can need to play ahead even uh, one game every two uh, uh, every two days or three days so supposed to be injuries and everything so it gives opportunity to the coaches to use more players 
and uh, divide the rhythm and the pressure of the game, of the, the physical side between more players. So for the moment, five players is good. I don't want, I do not want it for the long term because to change half of the team you, that you can change half the team in the game, it's good for basketball, it's good for handball, for football. I think it's too much, but but I would change it. I maybe change it for four players, and I would change one more thing. Uh, uh, that I, I, I saw it in the basketball is to let one of the players to go out and then come back. I think it will make more flexibility for the players and for the game it will be more interesting. And if I may say also because of this, I would change to make take one time out every half time, which when it's hot now, all the, all the teams are doing it. We can continue about discuss about this, but I think uh, for the moment five players, it's, it's good. For the long term, I would uh, change it to a different uh, different scenario. Charlie, have you been seeing some of the uh, Bundesliga games, and do you see any difference with the regular football that we've seen so far? Yes. Uh, thank you for having me, Guy. Um, thank you for having me with such distinguished guests. Uh, it's fantastic for me. I'm smiling the whole time, listening to Avram and seeing uh, Marcati's beautiful face. The uh, I would say this: that uh, I saw the games. Uh, in fact, I, I, I saw the Champions League games that were done behind closed doors before this. I saw the, the game that struck me as maybe the oddest was the uh, uh, Derby d'Italia with, uh, at Juventus when Inter went there. Gabrielle is Inter, Milan. Uh, and it struck me as a, um, a couple of things. The first is the rhythm is definitely different. No matter what you say, the players, it's hard for the players to have the rhythm go. In that case, the players were fit. Uh, and what I saw was the more professional team, the team that didn't rely on, on emotion, if you will. Uh, Juventus was very pragmatic and they were very calm and, and won the game, I thought, uh, easily. You could argue, well, if they had Juventus fans, it would have been worse. But, you know, sometimes players react well, even if, they're, even if the fans are antagonistic toward them. It gives them some, some strength. The games in the Bundesliga this last weekend were fascinating to me because, you know, you saw guys coming up with injuries, a lot of muscle injuries. Uh, you saw that they were not fit. Uh, and that, with the rhythm of the game being disrupted without the fans, I felt it was uh, tough to watch, but I agree with Avram if it's the lesser of two evils, if you will. And maybe the, the argument that I heard uh, from Andrea Butti months and months ago when they were deciding this, who's the head of competitions for Serie A, he said to me, well, this gives the people something to stay home and watch, which I think is a very, is a very I think of all the reasons that may be the most compelling to me. Mm-hmm. Gap, uh, have you had a, the time to analyze a little bit what we were seeing from the Bundesliga and if that can be uh, compared to what we will see soon in Serie A, in the Premier, in the Premier League, in, uh, in, in La Liga? What I mean by that is uh, um, the rhythm that Charlie mentioned, the injuries. Is that something we can learn from? I mean, I think certainly the, uh, all right, we have to remember first of, first of all that if we have a very, very small sample size, right? We're, we're talking literally about nine top flight games in the Bundesliga. Um, but as Charlie mentioned, we did see uh, a ton of muscular injuries, which to some degree often happens in, in preseason or at the very start of a season historically. Um, but this was more than, than was expected. Um, it's funny what Charlie said about the rhythm of the game and, and, and the way it felt different and some of the disruptions. Um, this morning, um, I taped my own podcast, but Gavin Jules' podcast, and Julian Lawrence brought all this data showing that actually, in terms of most of the physical metrics, in terms of sprints, acceleration, um, most of the data showed that these that this first round of games was actually quite similar to um, to what normally takes place in a Bundesliga game. So I genuinely don't know. I mean, I think we're 
the, we're in uncharted waters, right? So we're following the Bundesliga. I'm going to make an analogy. The, the, the Bundesliga, they're the boat that are out there in those choppy waters trying to navigate these straits. And La Liga, Serie A, and the Premier League have all different types of boats with different types of sailors. And they're trying to follow the path through, but it's probably not the only way through. And it's not guaranteed that they're going to go through in the same way or face the same challenges. Speaking to, uh, to a manager of La Liga yesterday, uh, they were saying, remember, in the Bundesliga, they're going to play one game per week. While in Serie A, uh, the Premier League and La Liga, we're going to have to play two per week. So forget about pattern of play, forget about style, forget about maintaining that intensity that is necessary for most of the, of the teams. So I imagine, Avran, at the end, what will be a success here will be the quality of your players, uh, more than whatever the manager can do with them. Especially, as I say, in those leagues that will have two games per week and they're going to have to make five, six changes per, per game. I think the manager has uh, more, more work to do now because of the five-start substitution, because of the intensity of the game, because of the preparation that was not good. Few of the players I had came with overweight. Few of the players trained well. And uh, it's like a training game. It's like a, a training camp if you look at the schedule. But the players need to play. So I don't expect that there will be intensity. If you speak about the Bundesliga, I was very surprised about the stats uh, that they uh, uh, had. But I can tell you that when I saw the game, it was I felt that there is more distance between the players, more distance between the defense and the, and the offense. And I don't know if it's because of the intensity only or because supporters was not there. Because supporters pushing pushing the teams. Also, even, even like uh, Charlie said, if the uh, if the supporters is against you. But if you speak of natural uh, football, don't expect that the players will be in the same shape like they was before. It's not normal if they'll be like this. And then we have intensity of the game and others. So the, uh, the, there is uh, two things that now the, the coach will have more more uh, job to do. And, uh, and second, the, the players, the good players, the players that can win the game, will be always there was a big fact of the game, big role of the game, but now it will be even more. Now, this is for the immediate. If you talk about the bigger picture, uh, I want uh, Gap to tell us why we were talking about 2024 as a kind of turning point in the, in the history even of, of, of football as it's organized at the moment. Um, then we'll get into if the plans that, uh, that people were discussing and go ahead or not. Why 2024? What's happening then? Well, the short answer is 2020, 20, uh, 2024 is when the international match calendar, which is basically the sort of master calendar agreed between all, everybody in football. So it's, it's, it's the FIFA match calendar, but it's agreed with the confederations, with the FAs, the leagues, and so on. And it basically sets out the rhythms of football. Uh, when there are international breaks, um, when you know there are pauses and whatnot, and you kind of you can't deviate from it because there are too many moving parts in different parts of the world. But 2024 it resets. So 2024 is the date, and it's going to have to be agreed a year or two before that. Where if you want to make changes, if you want to make big changes, if you want to, um, you know, for example, have longer international breaks but perhaps less of them during the year as some people have suggested or uh perhaps if you want to go and uh, i don't know set up some kind of uh global cosmic super league or something um that is a very good time to do it because that is when long-standing agreements lapse and when you can go forward so yeah, Charlie, isn't it also it, the Champions League, the MOU ends in 2024? That's the, the memorandum. Yes, that's, 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 yeah, that's a good point. That is the, um, that's the, uh, the memorandum of understanding, which is basically it's an agreement between um, the clubs, leagues, and, and UEFA, which governs the operation of European competitions like the Champions League and the Europa League. Now, normally it lasts, I think, I don't know how long it lasts. I think five years or whatever yeah. the previous one. The curious thing about this one is this one. I think was, it's six years. 
six, six years, years to get the two TV cycles. But this one was extended in such a way so that it would perfectly match up with the end of the FIFA match calendar. So mm -hmm. to look at it a different way, and this is an extreme situation, but there are some people out there who, who think that there is a big plot behind the scenes to do this. 2024, all the clubs could walk away from UEFA and FIFA and say, no, we're going to do our own thing. We're going to organize our own competitions uh, and, and, and something like that. Um, that is the big conspiracy theory in the background, which you know may or may not be uh, as much of a conspiracy as some suggest. Charlie, is there not much conspiracy then? Is there, is you know there much not much that? conspiracy? I don't know. I, just, I was thinking of, of when Gab said about the rhythm of the FIFA calendar. And I said, you know, there's a, you know what they call people who use the rhythm method of birth, birth control, don't you? <laughs> Parents. Uh, it is, uh, it's always a mess. And so, yeah, they agree on the calendar, but everyone starts at different times and ends at different times. And it's, uh, I guess there is, uh, I guess that, you know, does lend itself, as Gab says, uh, and as I was saying about UEFA, it does lend itself to conspiracy theories. I, I do think they're, <clears throat> they're real. I don't think they're conspiracy theories. I think they're more out in the open. I think that the world is changing uh, very quickly. I think that, you know, people look at the NFL and look at the NBA in particular and say they are max, they do it right. Whether they do it right or wrong is not, I'm not here to argue that, right? But a lot of people, particularly business people, believe that it's the right way to run a league. And, you know, the old, I was listening to an investment banker telling me that, you know, the reason why uh, LAFC is worth more than Crystal Palace is because Crystal Palace is only three bad games away from being relegated. And I get that. And, you know, Mr. Ross, the owner of the Miami Dolphins, the owner of my company, will always say, you know, we maximize revenues. That's what our goal is at the beginning of the year. Uh, I would dare I say the goal of Florentino Perez and, uh, uh, you know, Bartomeo and other folks are to win the league, to win the Champions League. That's their goal. Their goal isn't to say, they don't start the league and say, ooh, I want to be profitable. Maybe Stan Kroenke <laughs> does that at, at, uh, at Arsenal. Uh, no, I'm, I'm teasing Stan a bit. But, it, but it's, uh, I think there is uh, the thought that people are going to, there may be, and again, I don't think it's a conspiracy, but it may, they may take the opportunity of the calendar to do something different. That's all. And there was all kinds of talks that could happen from after 2024. And I just wonder, Avram, you know, in looking at the picture a little bit um, beyond uh, calendars and, and, and targets of, of businesses and clubs, there is a change, there's an opportunity of change right now as well, isn't it? Uh, all of a sudden, we are seeing clubs that will struggle to get to the end of the year. We're seeing that uh, fans have been completely abandoning the decisions that football have taken. We're seeing that there are some clubs in, in Germany, we're hearing the talk that, that uh, perhaps we should start thinking about clubs being closer to the community, uh, as if uh, there has been a divide between what football clubs were doing and what the fans wanted. Uh, and I just wonder if now, with a sense of more, uh, of a sense of crisis and a sense of, uh, of the opportunity of change, there will be that kind of talk within football, perhaps an opportunity to come closer all together. First, every, every crisis is opportunity from my side, you know, for uh, this is the way what I think. Every problem, even in a team, it's opportunity to change if you need to change. But if you go to specific uh, areas, you know, I think it's very difficult now to analyze what will happen in 2024, for example, uh, for the perspective of supporters, uh, if they like the Champions League, for example, or they don't like in players, it's look it's looking very good from any any part of it, even uh, financially or uh, how do you say professionally. Even it can be better, but it's looking good. So if something good, why we need the, if something is not broken, why we need to fix it? But 
but it's okay to to want it better about the community i think most of the team now is trying to use the football to come closer to the community and i think maybe this crisis will make it will make it more closer but if you will give to the support of the community to take this decision about football and everything which was suggested by a few uh, social media i think you will face uh, a lot of opinions and a lot of things and it will create also a mess so you need to be very careful how you do it even i think this is the time to do it you cannot ignore it the social media and everything control more, more a lot uh, more uh, a lot of things but at the end of the day you know every supporter of a team wants that his team will be successful so you need to run it by the professional side and the other people by the by the other sides of the football but we need to wait a little bit and see what will happen with this uh, corona time and to see where the football is going on because i think uh, what happened that many of the owners lost a lot of money and they cannot pay what they paid before uh, and other issues that will come up but still the nature of the game after a while i don't know if it will take few months or one year or two years the football will always strong man more than anything gab is that how you perceive as well that, uh, that perhaps the crisis financial crisis that we're going to be suffering and the fact that some transfers deals won't be like we've seen in previous years uh, is a temporary situation or do you think it will change football um well first of all i hope that the football will change because I think in the short term, um, there obviously we're seeing already there are clubs that um, are simply going to have cash flow issues and serious liquidity issues. One of the things that's been talked about, FIFA is sitting on more than two and a half billion of reserves and what they would like to do um, is, you know, they're in a position to help, but I think what they should do, and hopefully what they will do, is say this help uh, has to come with strings attached. This help with transparency, with financial regulation, with financial, with, with proper oversight, with good governance. Um, and so that the system can run itself better. You know, what, what you said before about, you know, football fans always want their team to, 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 to win or, or whatever. Yeah. If I, as a football fan, if I know exactly how much, how much money my club is spending, and I know exactly who is making the decisions at those club and uh, at the club, and how much those decisions are um, are, are costing my club. And I know what the um, what my revenues are going to be, and I know what my revenues were last year. If I have access to that, you have automatic oversight. I have automatic. I have an automatic interest to make sure that my club is well run. And you know, if you go and you sign a guy for fifty million who turns out to be rubbish. I can go to your door and say, Al, you made that decision. Same way if, you know, I sign this guy and I pay that guy a commission of 10 million or, or, or whatever, or I take a, a rubbish player to please an agent. All these questions, if we have transparency, we can go and do that. And I hope that is the single biggest change is that we get transparency and that we have good governance. Once you get past that, of course, football will come back. I, I, there's, no, there's no question. I mean, however bad this is, we're talking about what? maybe six months of lost gate receipts and potentially in some cases um, some lost TV money and some lost sponsorship. I wouldn't feel strong enough to overcome that. So Gab, you're suggesting that transparency will allow uh, the fans to take a little bit of a lead on what the clubs have to do or at least not to do things badly. But uh, I just wonder, Charlie, if, if you, um, you would need for football to change, if that's what we all say that should happen for the better. Uh, if you need more leadership, uh, is there enough leadership out there from either institutions or from personalities? Is there enough people driving football towards a better future? Well, I, I applaud what Gab's saying. I, I just think it's extraordinarily difficult. I, I think I heard Gab talk the other day, actually on our podcast, <laughs> about how organized Germany is and how um, and I and uh, you know maybe sometimes in past the history they've been a little too organized if you will uh, but you know they are organized and they are they are very you know they have the community and their league is community oriented etc the ticket prices are low and all those things are wonderful I was doing a uh, uh, yesterday I was talking to Real Madrid University 
uh, to the Madrid University, the Real Madrid executive program. And I had a, a young man from Colombia say, ask me a question. What do we have to do in South America to be as organized and as, as good as you know, leagues in Europe? Uh, and I basically said, you need to be organized <laughs> and you need to have transparency and you need to have good governance. All the things that, that Gabby's saying here. And, and I'm asking you a, a simple question. Well, you know, the, even, you know, that you look at any report on corruption in the world and you can, you, there's a map a heat map, if you will, for politics. And you could probably overlay it for football too in those countries, <laughs> that the football and the politics are probably corrupt, right? And so, and they're not transparent. And so I, I just think it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing that Gabby's saying. I think it's very intelligent. I think that, I think it's hard to implement. And I don't think the two and a half billion dollars goes that far. Uh, and I, they're certainly not going to give it all up to this. And it, it, you know, it's something like the the, the monetary fund that uh, Gabby really is sort of hinting at. That's the sort of thing that we're talking about here. You know, you're only going to give a country money if they can, you know, show that they're doing the right thing that isn't lining somebody's pocket. Uh, football is very, very different. It's uh, it is difficult to do in in. Colombia, what they do in Germany. It's difficult to do in Argentina what they do in England. And um, you have one governing body. And, and, and look, there's different modes. In America, if you said, give it to the fans, I would tell you that soccer would die. Because our whole system's based on wealthy people trying to, trying to make themselves more wealthy. Uh, and I think that England would probably be very similar if this went to a German model that, yeah, it would be romantic, it would be wonderful, and, you know, Huddersfield, again, would be a competitive, but I don't think it would, it would uh, change the game for the better. I, I, I just don't see it. Hey, Charlie, I want to talk can, I, can, can I just jump yeah. in on that? The, I think the, the, the one, I mean, look, I, I agree with you about the difficulties. But equally, how many times have we heard, especially from U.S. Uh, billionaires and executives about, you know, who had the opportunity to invest in European football and uh, in, in Spain or Italy or, or even England, I, I as you know. I was talking to Jimmy Pallotta this morning. Well, no, no, but ones who, <laughs> what I'm saying is ones who did not invest mm -hmm. because they didn't trust the system, because right. they don't feel that it's, they don't feel if I'm the new guy coming in with money into a system that I don't think is clean and transparent, I'm not going to invest unless I'm, I'm Roman Abramovich and I have more money than everybody. And then I can come in and change the system. But otherwise, why would I go? Well, why would I walk into a casino where I know that, you know, half the people in there are crooks and the other half of the roulette wheels are rigged. Right? So what I would argue is that this better governance, it's not just, it's a nice thing to do to have more transparency and better governance. It's good for business in the long run because it attracts more investors because people are going to believe that it's, that it is a good business and it's a legitimate business and it can run itself well. No, and I agree with everything you're saying, Gab. The, I think the subtle difference there is we talked about should they be more community oriented versus I, everything you're saying about transparency and governance is exactly what I said to the young man yesterday. And I think you're 100% right. I think you can establish that. Before I give you a dollar, show me that you guys are honest. And I think you can do that. I really do. It might be a bit of a challenge as you go throughout the world. But having said that, you know, I, my concern is not the investor investing. And you saw many investors went to England because the reality is I deal with American businessmen all the time and they say to me, well, you know, Italy is a shady place. I'm not going to go there, you know? Uh, and now you have a number of Italian Americans that are investing in Italy and said, yeah, and that's a great thing because they believe that we're not shady people, Gab, you and I, okay? <laughs> they believe that there's some honesty there and some transparency. They need to get 
a little more organized and get their governance in place. But you could say that about the government too in Italy. My point, a really simple one in this case is, you know, what are we saying here? Can they be more community oriented? Yeah, but then I think you do lose the investor, the billionaire, because they're saying, I'm going to be held up by, look, these people are very simple. Even Sir Alex Ferguson would tell you, Neil, I'm the boss. There's the only one boss. And you can't have, it's very difficult to, to get investors to invest their money if they believe that the majority of the community is going to tell them, we don't like this trade that you made. We don't like this guy that you bought. They're going to say, ah, it's, it's my money. You know, the great, the great thing someone said to me, I believe it was Seferin, but I may be wrong. I need, I need the, on, I need the, on. The, the real difference between American oh, sports oh, oh, and, and football is really obvious when they give the trophy. And it's amazing. And, you know, I never thought about it, but it's really true. In America, they, they get TV audience of, you know, 50 million people for a Super Bowl, 100 million, whatever the hell it is, and they give it to the owner. The owner. The guy who has money, they give it to him. <laughs> you know, I never, as growing up in America, I never really thought how absurd that is. You just got to give it to the captain to show the, to the fans. But in America, it's all, I'm not saying it's right in America, by the way. I envy the stuff going, I envy the relegation and promotion. I love all that, right? But I'm saying that, think about it for a second. You don't give the trophy to the guy who, who was the best player or who won the big game. You give it to the owner of the team. Good point. If uh, I may I say something. If I, if I said, as I heard before, it's always balance between this and between uh, this. Uh, if we spoke about the American, I'm sorry to say every owner of America will be happy from any situation as long as they earn money. So if the, if the supporters will be involved or not involved. And some people in Europe are more focused on the football side because, you know, football, we, I don't, I will, I never forget that football, we are starting to love the game and, and play the game, not, for, not because we like money like any other job. After this, if we are coaches or or players, we, we have money. So it's a balance between them. But I think, I think if we spoke about Alex Ferguson, even Alex Ferguson adapted a new situation. When Alex started, the manager was everything. He was the marketing guy. He was the financial guy. He was, he was bought players. He sold players. He, he was uh, responsible for everything. And slowly, slowly, when the private owners came, Alex became uh, busy only with football, which is uh, uh, good things for him. On the other hand, I think we need to find a way how to put the community more inside and, uh, and uh, involved in things, but not involved in, the, let's say, transfer things and other things. Because if you will ask supporter from uh, number one and supporter number two, each one of them have different opinion. And I had, uh, 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 I had some kind of lecture two days ago for university in America and it was for the technology uh, uh, part, and they asked me, why we not go to a situation that the coach will decide about nine players, and the social media between all the people around, they will decide about the other two. I said to him, it's a good idea. <laughs> Which is not a good idea, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> that is so, funny, uh, But you know, we, people we are, are thinking a... you now about different things, how to implement, you know, the... Uh, what's happened in the last year with the social media, the involvement of the community, and the involvement of the clubs in community, how to make it more stronger and more stronger without disturbing the nature of the game. So I wonder, uh, and um, with this we kind of uh, we can wrap it up. If you, the three of you can think of something, view of the circumstances, view of the possible changes, one thing that you would do to improve football, one thing that could be from capping the salaries, to banning states, buying clubs, to, as we heard, the possibility of fans having more involvement in, uh, in decision-making. Uh, if you had the opportunity to, to choose one thing, to change football for the better, what would it be? Who wants to start? Uh, I'll start, because I always say the same thing. Um, transparency. And I want to know... <laughs> it's the word of the day. No, look. Look, I, I completely agree with, with what you know, was said before about 
you know, you can't, uh, you, you can't let fans make decisions about signings or whatever. That's fine. But we want transparency. I want my club, if, if I'm a Barcelona fan, for example, I want to know, okay, how much money did we pay for Trincao? Who, who decided to sign him? Who got paid along the way? How much money does Trincao make? And so on. And if you get the decision correct, that's wonderful. I will sit there and I will applaud you, Bartomeu or Abidal or whoever it was. If you get the decision wrong and the guy turns out to be rubbish or somebody comes out and says, well, you paid this much, you could have paid less, then I as a fan, I as a paying customer, will go and I will criticize you and I will boo you from the stands and, you know, and I might show up at the training ground and, and whatever. I mean, this is business. This is how business works. When, when a company... Some would, say, Gab, that, Gab, some would say that that opportunity is there for the club that you mentioned, for Barcelona. Every six years, you can choose the president. So if you hear what they're doing, if, uh, and the media yeah. is doing that, that job to a point, then you can vote. Um, yes, every or six years. Yes. Okay, well, first of all, look, I, every six years at that club, at Real Madrid, of course, I can vote every six years as long as I find somebody who's been a club member for at least 60 years. years. And has a, yeah, and has like a personal <laughs> yeah. fortune of 100 million. And of course, there's many of those around, right? But look, I, I was talking more about the vast majority of clubs around the world. I don't have a problem with having an owner who owns a club who, who, who makes decisions and appoints people based on what he thinks is right and ultimately makes the final decisions. It's his money. It's his club. But I think, I think in the name of good governance and good decisions, I think all this information should be public because a football club is a social trust. It's not just a business, right? So that way I, as a fan can at least lobby vocally to my owner because even the wealthiest owners, they don't like being unpopular. And I can go and I can say, look, you know, so-and-so, you're a rubbish owner because you did that and you appointed this guy who was bad and that guy who was a crook. I think this is absolutely essential for the good governance of, of football. And, you know, we, when we talk about transparency and oversight, I'm not talking about having, you know, a bunch of auditors with their, with their calculators coming in or having a million rules like they have in Germany or in France as well. It's not necessary. It's just make all the information public. Let the local blogger at, at, at Rochdale United sitting in his underpants in his mom's basement sit there with the annual report or sit there with the monthly reports and say, hey, why are we doing this? Why are you borrowing against the value of the club, Mr. Owner? Have all this information out there because football clubs are not simple businesses like any other. I think by now, we, we should all be able to agree on that. I, I agree with you, Gab, on that. If I could jump in now. I think there's a couple of, of fascinating points that you bring up. One is that I remember sitting with the Glazers at a game at Manchester United, and they were booing them. They had the yellow and green, you know, things of the old, uh, I don't know, Heathcliff, whatever the hell it was called. Uh, and he said, you know, they're fans. They're allowed to do that. Uh, they, they pay good money to come see this, and if they have a problem with me, that's okay. I thought that was very mature, and I thought it was really a fair, a fair point. He also, you know, he also has to answer to shareholders, as he does. But the question we have now in America, which is a, an interesting one, especially in times of crisis, is who does the who do the uh, uh, who does the owner, if you will, have a responsibility to? Is it to the shareholders? Is it to the community? And in some cases, it's very, very different, isn't it? You know, if you go to a coal mining community, well, the, the shareholders of that coal mining community are going to, they're going to, they're not going to be the guys working in the mills, right? Working in the mines. They're going to be guys that are uh, investing. And so they, you got a complete different dichotomy there. But let, if I had to change one thing, to me, it would be a salary cap. But I want to tell you what, why I think it's difficult with a story. I was with Roman Abramovich, Avram's friend, on his boat in 2004 in Philadelphia. And Peter Kenyon at the time said, 
Uh, Charlie, Mr. Abramovich wanted to invite the owner of the Eagles, Jeff Lurie, to the to the boat, and you know invite Mr. Lurie, and so I invited Mr. Lurie. They were kind enough to invite me. We were putting on our tournament that. there. You know, the, at this time it was called the World Football Challenge. No, Champions yeah. World Series. Apologies. And mom. we're on the boat with Galliani uh, from AC Milan. And this is before there's any investment in the Premier League, 2004. And Jeff Lurie says uh, to Roman Abramovich, what's your, what's your EBITDA? What's your EBITDA, EBITDA, you know, earning for interest, et cetera, you know, for the, your club. And I think Mr. Abramovich had invested about 180 million pounds the first year. So he said, well, had lost that and said, well, it's a negative EBITDA. Eugene Tannenbaum said to him, his, who was interpreting and uh, talking. So they asked me to interpret for Galliani. So uh, Jeff Lurie says to Roman Abramovich, well, why do you invest in this? We in the NFL, we make money every year as we open the doors, you know? And, and Jeff Lurie says, I have an idea. Why don't I get my friends, my partners, which means the other NFL owners, okay, the biggest boys club in the world, 32 guys decide everything, okay? And he says, why don't I get my partners and we buy the Premier League? And Roman said, well, what would you do? He goes, I would implement a salary cap. We have a salary cap every year, and it decides between who's good and bad, it really comes down to who's more clever, who does the better trades, who has the better manager, et cetera. We all have an even playing field. We have transparency, which is what Gabby's calling for. Okay. And Gabby's right, by the way. <laughs> and he says to him, So I'm explaining this to Galliani in Italian, telling him, you know. Here's what he says. And Galliani says, tell him I think it's a really good idea. And they look at him and they say, see, even Galliani thinks it's a good idea. And then Galliani says, great, because if they have a salary cap in England, I'll be able to get all the players back to Italy. <laughs> and so I thought it was a great telling story that, you know, obviously with the European Union and, and it's difficult to have a salary cap that goes across all the leagues. You know, if, if, if Premier League's not going to lose its dominance uh, by saying, okay, I'll sacrifice and I'll lower my salary cap for this and that. So, and we all know, uh, Guillaume, you're in Spain, you know better than anybody. The only thing that matters to Real Madrid is that they're better than Barcelona. The only thing that matters to Barcelona is they're better than Real Madrid. So those two are an aberration. I think the problem we have is that it's, you know, things like financial fair play, the unintended consequence of that, and obviously it was to keep, keep the, the game financially stable, but the unintended consequence is the big clubs just got bigger, okay? We see now in Mexico, they've scrapped the second division. They've just decided they're not having a second division anymore. You know, and FIFA said, it's okay in America and Mexico, I guess you don't have to have relegation and promotion, right? And so it just, there's, there's, you know, I think transparency has got to start at the top, right? So if you can get at least the top five leagues or four leagues, because it comes down to money and say, we need to agree on a salary cap so we can be competitive. Well, you know, the only place that'll work is in a super league. Because the reality is the money that goes to Bayern Munich and Dortmund is so much more than goes to the other, the other, uh, you know, the, the other clubs in, in Germany. And so, and the same thing can be said for all the clubs in England and the, the few clubs in Italy, the, they just have more money than the other guys. So those leagues are no longer competitive. So the question is, can you have a salary cap to make all the leagues in Europe sort of equal? Or do you have a salary cap? You create a league that just has a, a genuine salary cap, and this league has all the big boys in it. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that's the right solution, but you have to control the salary because it's gotten out of, it's gotten that crazy. There's no way Juventus is not going to come in first and second, first or second. There's no way that Bayern's not going to come first or second. There's no way that Barca and Real aren't going to come first and second. 
PSG, give them the trophy in the beginning of the year. I'm glad they, I'm glad they gave it to them now because it's a joke anyway. So something has to change, and it has to start with you got to get the, the financial fair play that what it's gone it's gone crazy. It just helps the big clubs. Mm -hmm. Avram? Oh, it's very interesting what Gab and Charlie said, but I will start with a story that, uh, uh, and before the story, I will tell you all my life when I came to a team, I say, I'm not the guy, the financial guy. I'm, I'm uh, busy only with the professional side. I put a line and said, I don't care about the money. You will tell me what is the budget and I will learn. So I will not speak about what these fantastic two gentlemen spoke before, but I will tell you that uh, a story that will start about the nature of the game. Football is not a normal game. It's not a normal business, I'm sorry. It's not a normal business. And I will start with the story. I will not mention the name, but I will tell you it's the same name that Charlie mentioned before. One of the owners <laughs> is, Russian, is Russian, but I will not say more than this. And he mm -hmm. said to me, I, when he started, he said, what do you say about football? I say, one on one, one plus one is not two. After two years, it came to me and said to me, you didn't tell me that it's not even five. <laughs> So it's not normal <laughs> business <laughs> because all the emotion and everything, and there is not one way to do well. But I can tell you, I'm a big fan of uh, the NBA, by the way. Pete Jackson is my friend and I follow the NBA and the system and everything. And we can see that the La Liga and the, the Bundesliga and the Premier League are very, very successful leagues in the, in the last years and they are not running the same. But one, one thing you can comment for everybody, they spend a lot of money in the last 10 years. So they say, oh, everybody become rich. But supporters might come more, more good football players, more even more stars. I will not speak about Messi and, and, and Ronaldo and this, this is a unique situation. So the system is good, more or less. I would change a few things about the game and the rule, like I, saw, I said before, but about salary cap, I don't believe in this. I'm sorry to say that. Uh, and about uh, uh, leagues without relegation, like it's America, you can do it only in America. In America, it's working great. But I think about the salary cap, for example, if the MLS wouldn't do that, there would be even much more uh, a better league by the quality of the football. So I don't know exactly what to do, but I will change a few things about uh, the nature of the game. And one thing we need, we need to know, as I started what I say about uh, the Russian guy, I remembered when I was in Portsmouth, when I was a Portsmouth as a coach, my friends came to visit me. And it was a guy who's 80 years old. Hey, sorry, 90. Now he's 100. When I was a few years ago, they were celebrating 100 years. And my friend said to me, who is this guy? I said, he was before I came and he will stay after. So the team belonged to the owners, but they belong also to the supporters. That they, are, they was born with the team and they, are, they will die with the team. And I will never forget that I, was in, I gave a lecture in Oxford University a few months ago. And uh, one of the professors that I, people said to me that he was in a community of a Nobel Prize came to me and said to me, I have a season ticket that my father gave me. I have a season ticket. I said to him, yes, uh, you mean Chelsea? He said, no, Oxford. Oxford is third division. Of, he was so proud. So the team belongs to the owners, but also belongs to the supporters uh, as well. You not only have thought about the future, you actually are designing the future. Because you've got this 15-year relationship exactly the company name. has with La Liga, in which you will promote soccer in, in the U.S. and Canada. But as part of the agreement, you've got that La Liga will play a regular uh, match in the United States. So in view of the circumstances and, and the situation we're in, does that sl slow down the process or speed it up of La Liga playing abroad, you think? I, I, that's a great question. And uh, it's one we've thought a lot about. Uh, it, it's, it's, I, mean, I think everything's uncertain now with the pandemic, right? It's very difficult, it's uncertain. And, and I guess it's, you know, when they open up borders and I, I guess we could argue it's slowed it down a bit because it's slowed everything down a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Having said that, it's, uh, I'm having trouble understanding what the big problem is about having a game in, uh, in America. And I've talked to authorities. I will be like Avram this time. I will not name names. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and you know, it's between us. Yes. Yes. Between us for sure. <laughs> so I said to, I said to, uh, this person at a very high governing body, what's the problem? Well, it's against tradition. It's against the rules. I'm like, 
Okay, but I, I you still have an answer. What's the problem with us doing one game of, of the Spanish League in America? I mean, uh, one would argue that, you know, basketball has become global, has become better because of the dream team going to Barcelona in 92. And, uh, and you know, the NFL is about to start a, another team in, in, in England. Again, I'm not saying it's, it's, I'm not asking to move Espanola to Miami, although you would be happy, Guillaume, if I did, that, right? <laughs> uh, at least you get your home games. You could go to Miami for your home games. The, uh, oh, but, you know, my argument's always the same, and, and it goes back to what a crazy uh, and my wonderful friend, but who's a little bit uh, eccentric, De Laurentiis said to me. He goes, I have more Napoli fans in Australia Argentina and America than I do in Napoli. So my argument is always, well, why? Because I'm born in New Jersey, I can't see my team play in America once. Is it so bad? I don't really see why. What you're a better fan because by you were born by an accident of geography in Milan, like Gabby, right? And so he's more deserving to see his Inter Milan than I am to see my AC Milan. So I think it just helps develop the game. And I don't know if it's going to speed up or slow down because of this coronavirus, but I do think that, you know, our obligation is to La Liga and we are trying our best to promote La Liga here. And we have content. We have other stuff that we're doing every single day. And I just did the report for Real Madrid about who their fans are in the U.S. And there's 13.5, you know, rabid Real Madrid fans in the U.S. Well, you know, it's, it's not enough to give these people just some content that they get on the Internet. Why can't they see their team play once? You know, if you ask and I won't name names again, but if you ask some of these club presidents, should they have their team once a year maybe travel outside the country, they almost always say yes, but I can't say that publicly. Well, it's sort of like just the gonna Super, say, it's sort of like the Charlie, Super League. I was I'm just going to add that uh, exactly what you just said, it's my understanding of the situation. I hear all the points of view about the game abroad, but a lot of them, like the owners of the clubs or the, or the presidents, they don't want to say what they really think, which is that they would like to. It increases the, uh, the, the knowledge of the club abroad and the money as well. Uh, but the media, the fans, the federation, they're all against it in such a big way that you have to keep knocking, keep knocking, keep knocking until you make them realize that, uh, you know, Traditions is something that one day was not traditions. But uh, look, I mean, the one, we spent a lot of your time uh, being here. You well, I want to say one thing. Of, uh, I want to say one thing about very tradition. Interesting points across. Mm -hmm. I want to say one thing about tradition. The one thing I love is the most, uh, we do our radio show in the mornings, and the big thing against VAR that every Brit, every expat said was VAR is terrible. You know why? not because they get it right or wrong, but because we will have, we'll stop having arguments at the pub. And I said to him, <laughs> well, since you got VAR, you have more arguments than you had before. So what are you worried about? And so th this goes to my point about this, this, you know, the Premier League was created by tearing down tradition. They talk, oh, the Brits talk about the tradition and this and that, the Premier League, they literally took the first and second, the third and fourth divisions of English football and tore it up, Rick Parry and company. And they created the Premier League, the biggest league in the world. So tell me, tradition, if they didn't do that, they'd still probably be the fourth best league in Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's a powerful argument. So I want to thank you all for your time, uh, for your points, and, uh, and just hope that you keep safe and that we keep talking regularly. Thank you very much for being here.